This next presentation is regarding the Eco Series, which is the new dryer series that Matthew's company had prototypes out on this last fall. And we want to introduce that to the group. But before we get into that, I want to kind of restate what Mike Larson said at the beginning. I want to thank everybody for being here. I know some of you have come from quite a long ways. We know you have a lot going on and a lot you could be doing today. And we appreciate your time. That said, I'll go ahead and get started. Before we talk about the dryer itself, I want to talk a little bit about how the idea to build the Eco Series came about. There's a lot of options, a lot of different sizes of dryers, a lot of options and projects that we, we could have taken on. And I want to talk about why we landed on the Eco Series. So I'm here to present. I should have answers, but I'm going to start with a question. Who can tell me what the average size of the American farm is? Anybody have that number off the top of their head? Any guesses? 800? 16. 600? 1,000. Okay, 200, that's the smallest number I heard. According to the USDA Census of Agriculture, the average size American farm is 418 acres. Most people guess a lot higher. The reason I bring that up, the Eco Series is an on-farm dryer, and we'll talk a little bit more about the demographics there. Now, I realize that that 418-acre average size farm doesn't mean a whole lot. That doesn't necessarily define our customers. That includes 8-acre organic pumpkin farms outside of Boston, along with 20,000-acre ranches in North Dakota. So let's take a look at another number, a number that maybe means a little bit more when we try to define our customers. And that's what the USDA calls the midpoint acreage. The midpoint acreage is where half of all farms fall above and below. So if you took all the farm acreage in the United States of America and you said, who owns it? Half of it would be owned by producers that farm 1,100 acres and less, and half of them would be larger than that. Now, you could obviously do a two-hour presentation on farm demographics and USDA data. You could do a, a two-day presentation on that. So I won't beat this to death. But what I want to point out is this means there are a whole lot of farms between 800 and 1,600 acres. Your guess, Jack, is to the, the average size farm size. And I, does everybody agree that's where a lot of our customers fall into? So we were looking, we're looking at that data, and we're thinking about that data all the time, and we decide what to build. But one of the other points of feedback that we've gotten, and everybody knows, is that farms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I... I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One reason I kind of want to defend our choice and present the demographics to everybody in the room is this past summer, I was at a show with a, with a couple of the RSMs and I was out to dinner and I made one of the RSMs mad. Ever make you mad, Mike? No. Okay, it wasn't Mike. <laughs> but I made you mad earlier in the day, which made him more candid than he probably typically would be. This RSM isn't known for his candor. He's sitting across the table from me and he says, whoever decided to build that eco dryer instead of a big tower is an idiot. I said, thanks, Jeff, you're fired. <laughs> not really. Actually, the good thing about making, it was Griffin, not cruising. The good thing about making him mad was that I got some candid feedback. I guess I needed that. And it made me realize he's got 30 years experience in the dryer industry. He is definitely commercial tower centric, the people that know him. But it made me realize if he's thinking it, I'm sure there are other people thinking that. So let's talk about the data that we looked at to come to the conclusion that we came to. We've got some pretty reliable data as far as market metrics. And we took a look a couple of years ago when Joe and I were on the road doing road trips, hearing from guys that we need to make a six, seven, or 8,000 bushel per hour tower. And that project actually had gained some traction. There were some uh, preliminary design discoveries being, being done. And when we took a look at the sales data, what we saw is, I believe, oh, what's it say, 44 or 42, what's my number? 42, 24-foot diameter towers were sold between 2010 and 2011. Now, those are big projects. If you have one of those projects going in within 100, 150 miles of your shop, you probably know about it because it's probably a multi-million dollar project when they put all the equipment in place. Those would be big sales for you, big sales for us. MC will undoubtedly eventually build a bigger tower. But I don't know that right now is the time when there's only 40-some projects of that scale occurring in a given year, <coughs> and there's three major competitors in the space already, 
and that's not where our strength is. That's not where our name recognition is. It's, it's going to take a lot of effort to make some waves in that space, and we know it. So we took a look at some of the other data, and this next bullet point is very interesting. In 2010, which I know was a great dryer year, there were around 2,500 profile dryers sold in the United States, and most of those were under 1,000 bushels an hour. And we don't get our market share in that space. And we do have great recognition, name recognition in that space, and a lot of dealers that support that size installation. So we thought, let's take a look at that. We make profile dryers. Why aren't we selling more of them? We've actually got three different dryer lines that are profile dryers and even include uh, that smaller size that I mentioned. The Legacy, the Trilogy, and the Infinity, all three. But when you really stop and you think about it, the Legacy series, it's been around for a very long time. It is the old 75 and 80 series dryers. They're expandable. You've got multiple fans, multiple burners. Most of the models are actually bigger than that 1,000 bushels an hour. They're a great fit for the right operation. We sell a lot of Legacy dryers today. They're still our number one seller overseas, and they're still one of our top sellers in North America. But they don't fit all those operations that were defined by that 2,500 uh, sales that occurred in 2010. Matter of fact, they don't fit most of them. Mostly they're going to a little bit bigger operator. The Trilogy series, this is our vacuum cooled profile dryer. Has anyone in this room sold a Trilogy? <coughs> Rich has sold a Trilogy. One dealer, bunch of dealers in here. You can, okay. They're not a big seller. They were a response to some dealer and salesperson requests for a vacuum cooled profile. It was the first redesign done by the current uh, engineering management regime, if you will. And we built a Cadillac for a Chevy market. By and large, the Trilogy owners are happy. We still sell Trilogies. There's probably some customers that are a fit for Trilogies, but they're never going to sell in large numbers. It just is what it is. So what about the Infinity? The Infinity series is exactly a fit for that 2,500 customers that we defined on the first slide. And it's a solid dryer. But in talking to dealers, I'm hearing this directly from different dealers that we quizzed about this, it's a hard sell. Head to head against our competition, we lack obvious differentiating features. We even talk about controls, but you're in a price sensitive market. We've got great controls. We've got a standard discharge moisture sensor that's made by Dryer Master. It's the best technology on the market, but it's expensive and it's standard. Some of our competitors don't put a discharge moisture sensor on their dryer as standard. That's not apples to apples. When the guy's trying to put a dryer on his farm at the least cost possible, it's a disadvantage for us. We put a lot of money in a welded base. It's a great base. It'll survive a nuclear war. It's hard to convince your 60-year-old farmer that his dryer needs to survive a nuclear war. And he should spend a few uh, grand extra so that it will. So at the end of the day, we have a dryer that lacks differentiating features to justify its price in the mind of a lot of farmers and dealers to the point that I heard point blank from some dealers that if they sell one of our competitors' brands, that's the brand they offer to this part of the market, and if they only sell MC, they don't even go after this part of the market. I heard it's a waste of my time. Unless the guy walks in the door and says, I want an MC, and he knows he's not a price shopper, he doesn't bother. He won't even quote it because he feels like he's going to lose the deal. So what's this tell us? This tells us if we can build a competitive profile dryer with differentiating features that's price competitive and that is highly configurable so we can sell what the customer wants instead of telling the customer what they should have, there's a huge opportunity for us and for you. And the result of that market research, we developed a mission statement. Deliver a dryer that competes with lower cost competitors without compromising MC quality. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joe Schofer, who's going to talk about some of the specifics of the project. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. The Eco Series Dryer came about earlier this year in January. We have our annual business planning meetings that we hold as a management team back in Crystal Lake. And this is where we got the idea to come up with this project. We've been focusing a lot on the tower dryers. Lately, the last few years, we've redesigned our 10-footers, we've redesigned our 12-footers, and it was time to start looking at some other opportunities. This project as a whole is targeting a different install base, a different customer base. This is going to target our smaller on-farm operations, and there were a couple key objectives that we set out for with this 
with this project. Number one, it needed to be cost competitive. Um, and when you do something and try to make it cost competitive or price competitive, it cannot skimp on quality and it cannot skimp on performance. And, and so those were kind of our two defining characteristics of this. We had to focus on price and we had to focus on performance and quality. In order to carry out this project, we had to take a different approach. Our normal product development path is to design the dryer, we build it, we cost it, and then we see if we can sell it. This is what we did when we designed our 10-footers. It's what we did when we designed our 12-footers. But we had to take a totally different approach with this product because we knew from day one where we needed to be competitive as far as price is concerned. And so that's exactly what we did. We did our homework first. We said, this is where we need to be. For this many bushel per hour, this is where the price needs to be set. And so we did that on day one so that everything from that point forward was all based on price, which turned into a budget or a cost, if you will. Then we could turn it over to Mike and his team and let them start designing the product with cost in mind. And that involved a lot of work between Mike and his group, but also Ed, who is our director of operations back in Crystal Lake. We took a lot of new ideas and put them into practice with this new dryer. And then when we were all said and done, we didn't have to worry about if we're going to be competitive or not from a price standpoint, because as long as we hit our budget with everything that we were working on, we were able to uh, proudly go out and, and advertise this new product. And that's exactly what we are doing here today. This project as a whole required a lot of collaboration. You'll see up there some of the different departments that were involved back in Crystal Lake to help make this happen. We talked about sales, doing the market research talked about engineering, R&D, obviously there was a lot of involvement there, but we also got our dealers involved too, some of which are in this room today, that helped us give us ideas, things that maybe we were overlooking, and, and that's something that we've incorporated into every new product that we've developed in recent years. Obviously, production operations played a big role in building our first five prototypes that we tested this fall, and quality was going to be a very important aspect of this product just like any other and so this machine went through the same extensive quality checkout procedures that we would on any dryer that we build for that matter. <clears throat> Some of the things that we had to take a look at was how we built this dryer and we're going to get into all sorts of details as this presentation goes on but this slide just shows some of the different challenges that we faced right away. You'll learn some of the characteristics of this dryer. It doesn't have the full-blown welded base like we have on our other profile style dryers. So that in and of itself changed the way that we go about building the dryer. Historically, with a welded base, we'll spend a day just pulling parts, getting them in the fixture, welding them, and then grinding welds and cleaning it and then painting it and letting it dry for another day. So we're two days behind the eight ball before we can really even start assembling the dryer. Whereas with this new design, you'll learn that we can start building it right away on day one and, and start pulling parts and bolting things together. Other challenges that we had ahead of us were how to interact with the screen section and how that's built in its typical area in the plant and then putting that on the base. And then things that we might take for granted in the past, like how do we even move the machine around the factory? And that picture on the right-hand side there just shows uh, one of our forklifts, a pretty big forklift, actually, uh, lifting the dryer up and moving that around throughout our facility. So we wanted to build a machine that performed as well as some of our recent new products, like our new 10-footers, our new 12-footers. But we had to do that with, with cost in mind. So it required us to do uh, some things that were pretty creative in terms of how we were able to get better performance than what you would see in an Infinity Series dryer of comparable size and do it for, for a cost that's going to make sense for our market. So three key things that we looked at. Number one, we went to a wider grain column with this dryer. Our traditional Legacy or Infinity Series dryers has a 12-inch column. This dryer has a 14-inch column. We'll see that in greater detail. Uh, we removed what we felt were features of this dryer that our customers did not want to pay for in this particular market. We also took two fans away and did the job with one fan. And that's just one area where we're able to take a considerable amount of cost out of the machine. 
Looking at those features a little bit more in detail, you'll see with the 12 inch to 14 inch column, those are images up there that are drawn to scale. They're, uh, from, a, from a, a quick glance at it, it doesn't look like there's that much more holding capacity in the cross section of that dryer, but when you do the math, it comes out to about 10 to 15 percent more grain that can be held in that dryer than our traditional 12 inch. And those screens were just moved in two inches all the way around the dryer. And putting more grain in the dryer allows us to dry more grain. So that's the benefit of it, but we had to look at other things like what's the moisture variation going to do to us when it's coming out the dryer? What's the static pressure requirement going to change to now that you have a deeper grain column? And all those things were taken into consideration as part of the design of this machine. The other big thing that we were able to save a lot of cost on, and this is more along the lines of labor as opposed to material, was, was the base itself. And this is just a couple pictures of our welding department where we are welding a base. And like I said, it took time to weld it and paint it. And these are all things that are delaying a, a typical profile dryer build. So we're able to take a lot of cost from the labor standpoint. Labor is overhead as well. And so we were able to expedite not only the build of it, but also decrease the cost. Third and final differentiating feature of this dryer is the fact that instead of two fans, one for each plenum with a heat and cool machine, we're able to do the job of those two fans with one large centrifugal fan that has some specially designed duct work. It's designed such that the air flows are automatically balanced by having an equal amount of pressure drop across the burners and that in turn puts the right amount of air into the top chamber, the right amount of air into the bottom chamber. And it's a very well built fan. It's, it's a centrifugal fan. It's going to be belt driven. It has a, a dual wheel design. As you see in these pictures, there's an inlet on either side. And it is running at a very low speed and it's very quiet. If any of you have been around our tower dryers, you know how quiet those are. This fan, when it's operating, makes those tower dryers seem loud. Actually, this is very quiet. We're going to be talking to an end user here a little bit later, and uh, it might be a good question to ask them is, what did you think about the noise levels uh, of this dryer? So I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to talk a lot more about the details and the features of this particular uh, product. He's going to get into all the nitty-gritty details, and by all means, don't be afraid to ask any questions. So with that, Mike, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. So I want to start off by showing a high-level view of what the Eco Dryer looks like, some of the similarities and differences that we've got between this dryer and what we've done traditionally with our profile dryers. And later on in the presentation, I'll get into some of the finer uh, design features. So right off the bat, you'll notice that Quite a bit different than what we've done in the past is our fan section here. Our high voltage cabinet bolts directly to the base, and we use the same pinnacle light control cabinet that we use on all of our dryer, which mounts directly in the front of the dryer. Uh, opposite of the high voltage cabinet, we have our plumbing assembly mounted to the dryer, and we use the same plenum uh, RTD, uh, excuse me, the plenum uh, thermocouple that we use uh, for our Infinities and Legacies. Right next to the burner assembly, uh, the plumbing assembly, we have our burner control cabinet. We use the same vindicator switch and the same four RTD probes. One of the things that's quite a bit different is the fact that we, the standard offering for this eco is a one foot discharge. This can be upgraded to a three, a five, or a seven foot discharge. And then also can be upgraded to a discharge system with a discharge moisture. Sensor. So if you have the sensor, you'll need the sampler as well, which needs to be put on either a three, a five, a seven foot extension, obviously because it can't fit onto a one foot discharge. And then just like our Infinities and our Legacies, an infeed sensor is optional as well. So when we set out to design this dryer, we came up with four different sizes, a 12 foot, a 16 foot, a 20, and a 24 foot. And our naming nomenclature looks like it does right up here on the screen, where it starts off with an E, which stands for eco, followed by a three-digit number. 
Those three digit numbers represent the amount of, dry, um, of holding bushels uh, inside the dryer. And there's another model here. The ones that you see up on the screen are for heat and cool. But if it's followed by uh, lowercase h, that means it's an all heat model. So as we mentioned, one of the goals of this project was to create a dryer to outperform, design and manufacture a dryer to outperform the infinity. And we knew in order to do that, we had to increase our holding volume. <clears throat> and we wanted to keep the outside dimensions of the dryer the same. So we had no, no other place to move and increase that holding volume other than to take the inside screens and offset them toward the plenum side, approximately two inches. So what we went from was a, approximately a 12 inch grain column to a 14 inch grain column. And as we mentioned, one of the other goals of this project was to not only design a dryer that was gonna outperform the infinity, but also do so and manufacture this at a cost and a budget less than that of the infinity. But we also didn't want to sacrifice any quality along the way. So when we were able to take a look, there's quite a few different areas where we were able to take some costs out there, unnecessary costs. And one of them was the screen section and the labor involved in assembling a screen section on our floor. In the past, we had the 12 inch wide screens and we said, well, if we double that up, it would take out half the assembly time. But of course, doubling that up, we want to make sure that we didn't lose any quality in that as well. So where we offered as a standard on our Infinity was a 18 gauge galvanized vertical screen. We beefed that up to a 16 gauge galvanized vertical screen. <clears throat> so one of the most important aspects, obviously, of the dryer is the fan. And we knew that in order to get the performance, we had to have the fan to deliver the CFMs that we needed. And we relayed back a lot to some of the findings and some of the work that we've done on the 10 foot and 12 foot tower designs, the redesigns. And we saw that there was a certain CFM that we wanted to achieve per bushel in order to get those capacities. Now we had to look at a couple factors here. So we had to increase the CFM and we also had to do so under different conditions. Those different conditions being the wider grain column. That wider grain column created more static pressure and we also had while we're specking out the fan, we're specking out new burners too. These new burners are going to increase the static pressure as well. So we were able to identify a centrifugal fan that was going to be able to, that was able to deliver the CFM under these new conditions and do so quietly. The next step was how we were going to incorporate the fan into the dryer design. We knew right off the bat we wanted to make it belt driven. Making it belt driven gives us some versatility and so that we were able to identify two fans for all of our eco dryers. We have one size fan for the 12 foot and the 16 foot, and then a larger size fan for the 20 and the 24 foot. And we just simply just changed the drive configuration to get the RPMs for the necessary CFMs for that particular dryer. And one of the other things we did and took into consideration was belt slippage and making sure that we sized it appropriately to take in, into account a standard of 2% belt slippage. So if I needed 1,000 RPMs, I would size the drive for 1,020. Now given the market that we're going after for this, <clears throat> it's pretty common that the customer that would be interested in a dryer like this, is a very good chance that they would have single phase power on their site. As a matter of fact, the last couple of years, if I looked at all the data from all the infinities that we sold, approximately 50% of them had single phase. And we want to make this as affordable as possible. So we came up with another configuration to handle this. While we offer an engineered solution, the VFD solution, we also offer another one which is less expensive, which is a dual fan configuration. This obviously doesn't have to come into effect for the E300, which runs off of a 15 horsepower motor, because I can get my hands on a single phase 15 horsepower motor. The problem lies in the E400, 500, and 600. The 400 uses a 20 horsepower motor, fan motor, while the uh, 500 uses a 25 and the 600 uses a 30 horsepower fan motor. So for the E400, what we've designed was two single phase 10 horsepower motors to drive the fan. For the 500 and the 600, it's two 15 horsepower single phase motors to drive the fan. So now that we had the fans identified, we we're also working on the uh, burners. Um, in collaboration with that. And we've had a lot of success, again, with our Midco burners, those cast aluminum stainless steel burners. After looking at all the different size, the four different size eco dryers from the 12 foot to the 24 foot, 
Along with the heat and the heat and cool, we are able to identify six different burners that are going to fit our application. So what you're looking up on the screen right now is an all heat application where we remove the ducts so you can get an idea of where the burner's lying. So for 500 and 600, it uses a 900, uh, excuse me, a nine foot uh, burner. While for the 300 and the 400, it uses a six foot burner. And one of the other things that we came up with was a, a vaporizer adjustment assembly where we have two plates that bolt next to it, up against each other and gets fastened to the side of the burner duct. This assembly moves in two different directions to get you better uh, adjustment given the different ambient conditions you'll see throughout the year. Up on the screen now is a heat and cool configuration. And then once again, we went back to the 10 foot and the 12 foot towers. And one of the key aspects um, and design features of that was what our ratios were from heat bushels to cool bushels. And we wanted to maintain that same ratio for this eco dryer. One of the things that we noticed with that was for the 500 and 600 dryers, that floor would lie and divide that dryer up, right? Where it can have a dual purpose, and we use that. So instead of just being a floor, it also works as the bottom, it uh, makes up the bottom portion of that burner duct. Unfortunately for the 300 and 400, that floor lies directly in the middle of those, and we couldn't incorporate a dual purpose for, the, for that floor, but we, incorporate, we ended up just putting it in the middle anyway. <clears throat> For the 500 and the 600, we use a seven foot linear uh, foot long burner in the top plenum and a three and a half uh, foot burner in the bottom plenum. And then for the 300 and the 400, we use a five foot burner in the top and a two and a half burner size burner in the bottom. And one of the things that stand out with the heat and cool is the fact that you can independently control uh, each plenum's temperature. So we have a separate set of controls for the top a separate set of controls for the bottom plenum. I mentioned a little bit about the market and um, some of the characteristics with that market and we thought about that quite a bit and we thought well there are some end users out there that know without a doubt they'll never ever run that bottom burner. They always run it cool so we wanted to offer in the future here another bottle that model is followed by HC. The HC stands for heat cool because that's exactly what it is. You will get the cool, you'll never get the heat in the bottom plenum because we'll sell it without the burner and the burner controls. Because if the end user knows they're never going to run it, why are they going to want to pay for it? So this is just another option that we're going to be offering here in the future. One of the nice things with this project was it gave us and my engineering team an opportunity to address some of the feedback that we've gotten over the years from the dealers or customers or RSMs. And so little things, little design changes, we, we took the opportunity to uh, capitalize on those. And one of them was like easier access, easier access to the fan, to the burner. And we came up with this uh, little contraption here where we have a hatch. The hatch lid is slightly larger than the opening and it's hinged and it opens up toward the fan. And the closed position and the latch is shut and it's in the same direction as the airstream. Makes for easier access and uh, maintenance on the burner itself. Another opportunity we, we saw here was to take a lot of costs. As Joel mentioned, the, the welded base, it takes a lot of time to manufacture that in our facility. And at the end of the day, the market that we're going after, it doesn't necessarily need a Sherman tank of a base. While it's nice, do they want to pay the extra money for it? There's chances are that they don't. So we came up with a bolted design. And with this design, we wanted to make sure that we didn't sacrifice it all in quality. So the material we made it out of was quarter inch thick formed C channels. So it's pretty beefy of where they bolt up to each other. We also, instead of using a splice plate to help join them and create that seam, we had the same material, quarter inch thick formed C channels that are embedded directly at that seam to give it the rigidity it needs. One of the other areas that we took a long, long look at was on the bottom of the base and the auger and the auger pan cleanup. We've had a lot of complaints in the past where you can't clean out the metering rolls. So we came up with this design where we hinged the, the auger pans as high as we possibly could. And in the open position at the end of the season, they're able to not only get access to the auger, the takeaway auger, but also to the metering rolls for cleanup. Another cost savings opportunity that we had was why drive this thing off of a pulley system on the takeaway auger? 
be a lot quicker in our facility, a lot more rigid of a design if we went direct with the gearbox. So we got rid of the two pulleys in the belt and we put a 10 to 1 Dodge gearbox on there to drive the takeaway auger. One of the other things that we got rid of was the crown, the proximity uh, switch target crown. As you remember on the metering rolls, we have that pronged uh, piece that goes on the end of the shaft. That's what the proc switch picks up to, an, to see how many times the metering rolls are turning. But we got rid of that. Why have an extra component when we can pick up on the teeth of the sprocket? And that's exactly what we did. With the fact that we don't have a welded base, we wanted to make sure that it was as rigid as possible when it's going down the road for portability. We wanted all that weight to be put down onto an axle, as opposed to <laughs> that weight being transferred directly as a torsional force on the base. We ended up coming with this axle design. It's two C channels welded back to back to each other with the hubs welded on the ends. And the hubs bolt to the side of the base simply just for alignment purposes. Okay. I've got a question. I've got like three transport kits. <coughs> uh, those look like the same. Hub assemblies, can I get the channels and, and make transports or do I have to purchase another set of transports the whole set? The hubs are slightly different on the whole pattern for how they will bolt up to the base. Um, but we do sell this portability kit specifically for the Eco and because the widths will be different too. And the old portability is we didn't have an axle at all. As Joel mentioned, there's a lot of different challenges that we had, not only in the design uh, aspect, but also in the production. And then we had to come up with a way to transfer this dryer, not only um, onto the truck, but once the truck gets on the site, off and onto the site. So we ended up coming up with this design where it's two uh, pieces of tube stock measuring four inches by two inches, welded back to back with quarter inch wall thickness. And then on the ends, we have lifting plates there. We tested this out with great success at our facility where underneath the dryer, they bolt underneath the base, they go with the truck, they get lifted up onto the truck. As the truck hits the site, it gets lifted off, and then the, the lifting brackets come back with the truck driver. It's been brought up in the past that this is something that some people would want to purchase considering this just goes with every dryer and that's something that we can do. We got a lot of feedback with our leg kits and the cost of them. So here was a perfect opportunity for us to take a look at it. We worked very closely with operations on this to come up with an efficient, cost-effective design. And there's a few aspects to that. One of the things that we did was we used the slot and tab manufacturing process where one part would be slotted, the other one would be tabbed, and they fit together like a puzzle. And what this does is, after doing some research on the floor and seeing um, the time invested with our old leg kits, there's no need for a fixture, no more need for a lining, locking down the fixture, you turn around with a weld. Instead, this fits together like a puzzle, so the alignments are already there because that's created by our CNC laser, which is as accurate as you can get, and then we apply the weld after the fact. The other thing that we looked at is tr we try to make as many common parts throughout the dryer as possible. So if you look at the whole dryer as a whole, we're able to have a lot less machine setups with those more common parts, which takes away a lot of the labor costs that would be associated with the more different parts that you would have in another dryer. So we came up with four different kits for the leg kits for the four different size dryers, starting off with eight legs for our smallest dryer, the E300, all the way up to 14 legs for the E600. So that kind of goes over some of the higher end uh, design features and from this point I'm going to hand it on over to Jeremy. Thank you Mike. Well, as Mike mentioned, we landed on eight models total, four all heat, four heat and cool. They're 12, 16, 20, and 24 foot sizes. And our capacities range from 310 bushels per hour to 1,100 bushels per hour. So that 1,100 bushels per hour is an all heat number. You want to take a look at the full specs. They might be a little hard to read in the back of the room. We're going to be handing out some brochures and other material here in just a moment. But you can actually see the motor configuration where the three-phase motor ranges from 15 horsepower up to 30 horsepower. Again, the specs, you see uh, in heat and cool, uh, 270 up to 535. And here we are at five points down below. 610 bushels an hour at five-point removal. That's, that's the larger dryer in heat and cool. 
This here is an order form, and at this time we're actually going to hand out. We've got some price books. One thing I want to mention, if anybody's looking for new price books, we've got EcoSeries price books. Your current price books are still effective going forward. If anybody needs new copies, let Mike or myself or Tamara know. We'll make sure you get some. But uh, your price books from last year are still effective for all dryer models outside of the EcoSeries. And these are your EcoSeries price books, an order form, and a brochure. And we've got additional brochures out front. Right, the next slide, just showing you some of the other options that were on the uh, order form, your fill option location that hasn't, hasn't changed from the Infinity Style Dryer. Now this here, this is just graphically representing what we talked about with your discharge options. Here's your one foot discharge auger. Here's your three foot discharge auger with a discharge sensor and sampler. And here you can see that obviously you need a minimum of three feet discharge to support the sam sampler and sensor. Here's your walkway and rear platform. Again, this has not changed from the Infinity style dryer. I'm going to hand this over to Joe, and he's going to talk a little bit about the testing and the project as it as it got underway. Yeah. Some of the things that we did early on in the development of this dryer took place before we even designed a single part. One of the most important things that we needed to do was figure out if going to a 14-inch grain column was going to be a, a viable solution or not to get more holding capacity in the dryer. And so in March or April of this year, we set out, we built a small mock-up just to test how well the 14-inch grain column would work with our metering rolls, how well the grain would drop through the column. And if we saw any moisture variations or excessive temperature variations across the column in the grain, and that's exactly what we did. That's just a picture showing the grain column on a nice sunny day in Crystal Lake. You can see we have viewing ports down here. We had a complete plexiglass uh, uh, panel along the side so you could see it. And uh, it was enough that we felt comfortable moving forward. Michael, question. Right. Do you have solid we'll we'll get to that a little bit he's going to go over some of the details as far as what we started out with from a prototype standpoint and where we're ending up with the product going forward with full commercial production next year is, is a little different so i'll have him address that in just a minute the other thing that we were looking for in this to cut some cost was the width of that panel is now 24 inches instead of 12, so we wanted to see if there was any excessive bulging or buckling or anything that would aesthetically not look right with this dryer. So we, we were able to do a lot of that before we really got into the, the meat of this, this design. For those of you that have been to, to our facility in Crystal Lake, you'll know we have a very nice area set aside just to do testing with real world grain. We have our own bucket elevator and, and holding tanks and material handling equipment and it was no different from this project than any others in the past. We were able to fill it with grain. We were able to do a lot of the testing we like to do on our terms, not on farmer who might not have the patience we want to have to do the testing. So we were able to install different temperature measurement devices inside the plenum measure the airflow coming out of the dryer, the whole gamut of what we've done on any of their projects that we've taken on in the past. This dryer up here is actually the very first one we built. It was our E500 that went out to Ohio. We were able to, for the first time, see the entire dryer in terms of how it handled that wider grain column, and, and the results were very positive. We got a lot of data out of it, and we'll have a snapshot of some of the design features that we were able to test and, and you'll see it real world here with some of the temperature contour plots and the airflow contour plots. Like any other project in the past, we set out to develop a certain number of prototypes before this dryer was going to be widely available and, and this, was, this was no different. We set out to install anywhere from four to six different machines like Jeremy and Mike have talked about prior to this. We have eight different models when you take into account the all heats and the heat and cools. We were just trying to get two of the larger ones, two of the smaller ones, and hopefully get a couple of guys that were interested in the all heats. They don't sell as commonly as the heat and cool machines, but getting four to six different installations was our target. Working with our great dealers all throughout the Midwest, we were able to get five of them installed. Two down in Iowa, 
down here. We were actually just at one of the installations yesterday. We took a group of dealers out to the one site this morning. That was actually installed at Iowa State University for their Ag Engineering program. So it was a great opportunity for Matthews to work with their staff and students there. We had another one in the uh, Northwood area, AgriSales area, and then we have the one up that Gateway put in up in North Dakota. We have one out in Ohio, the one I spoke about that was actually a very first prototype sale we had, the very first one we built. And then we had one closer to home in, in Crystal Lake here where uh, I was a longtime partner, farmer of Matthew's company. He was able to justify moving his trilogy off to the side for the year and put in the Eco Series. And now we're working on selling his trilogy series. Overall, a, a good spread in terms of throughout all the different regions. We just really struggled this year getting wet grain. Two of the sites in Iowa didn't really see much more than, I don't know, 10, 15,000 bushels through it. The machine out in Ohio, he really put that thing to the test. He had several hundred thousand bushels. I think he said yesterday around 220,000 bushels he ran through the dryer. He talked about how the thing would run for three, four days straight. He wouldn't have to worry about it shutting down or anything like that. Can you hear me, Warren? Yes, I can. Okay, we can hear you here. We're in Bloomington, Minnesota with a group full of dealers. We've been telling them how great the Eco Series is, but they know what my job is. So they're a little right. suspect. It's probably uh, more credible if, if uh, you share your experience. So I won't lead you at all. If you want to want to tell us about your experience with the dryer, and the guys might have some questions. So which size dryer, which model dryer was it that you purchased, Warren? I have the E400. The E400 through Gateway? That's correct. Okay. How'd that dryer go together? Any trouble with the installation? Not at all. Not at all. I think uh, Nick with uh, Gateway and their crew, they put that in in uh, oh, probably a day or whatever. And the uh, profile of the dryer was a uh, nice fit for the replacement. I had a Bail in 360 or 380 or whatever previously. And this one fit right in with the uh, overhead wet pin and the uh, takeaway weight. So uh, it was, that worked out real well. I liked it. Now, how many bushels did you dry this year? Are you willing to share that? Sure. I forgot to check. That was one thing I was going to look. The last time I looked, it was up to uh, 18,000. Okay. So. So it wasn't a whole lot. Most of those bushels were right at about 22. I took them down to uh, 15, 15, 5. Now, did the dryer meet your expectations as far as capacity goes? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I, it was, uh, it actually, uh, I work alone. I harvest and dry. And it really kind of kept me busy. It did quite a bit. Uh, more capacity than my previous dryer, and uh, it kept me, kept me, uh, you know, every time I turned around, it seemed like the wet skin was getting low again, so it kept me pretty busy. I think it probably does, you know, I'm sure it does at least as much as it's advertised or better. I'm not really sure where the uh, numbers would fall between the, uh, you know, taking 22, 23 moisture corn down to 15. And I was, I did it uh, all in the heat and cool mode. Okay. Any idea on drying costs? Uh, well, thankfully the uh, propane was uh, a little, you know, a little bit cheaper this year than it had been in the past. So uh, I'm thinking we got our cost down to, I don't know if it was five, six cents a bushel or something like that. Yeah. Very good. Right. Now, how about uh, operationally? Any trouble with the controls? I'm going to brag about Warren for a minute. Warren, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I was told our guys showed up at the dryer and you were already running it. Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah. That's, uh, that's a Should testament to uh, how well and simple that thing is designed. Uh, even a uh, farmer like me got it. Uh, I started taking wet corn. It was some of it was 26 moisture or whatever on a Friday, and I thought, Oh man, I don't want to sit on this corn over the weekend by Monday. That could be pretty, uh, not too pretty anymore. So I thought, well, we'll turn on the switches and see what happens. And like, oh, it didn't take much and uh, we were drying corn. And you, right? know, 
You know what I heard you did? Because this is a rumor. I heard you read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> I did get accused of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was quite helpful. Yeah, straightforward. Uh, yeah, I read the manual, and we were up and running. Yeah, I like it. You got to be. You got to be pretty independent, and willing to read manuals when you're a few hundred miles away from help, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. Sometimes that's uh, the way it goes. Yeah. Well, let me ask. Let me ask this group if they've got any questions for you. Yes. How do you like the AccuDrive? How did you like your AccuDrive? You did have AccuDrive, correct? I did, and that really, uh, I was very impressed with that. I expected to see some, uh, you know, variability or whatever, and uh, it it wasn't long after I had uh, booted it up that we started. Drying and the uh, AccuDry was, um, well, I would say it became available, so I initiated it. And uh, I tell you what, it's just flat line. We were right on uh, 15 discharge moisture, and uh, it, you know, it was just amazing. And uh, another nice thing is that MC Track, that, that is really a quick feature. Uh, you can, it gives you such peace of mind. You can be anywhere and Look at your phone and see right where your moisture is at, if everything's coming along, and uh, that, that really works good. I, I tell you what, that makes my life a lot easier. Yep. We're glad to hear that. Hey, Michael. What kind of venom temperature was he drying? What temperature did you dry at? Uh, the uh, top. I was using a heat and cool mode. So the top one was uh, 220. How was the how was the noise at the dryer? Oh, that was uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, one fan on there is uh, really nice and quiet. It's, uh, that's pretty impressive compared to the old axial fans I'm used to. Uh, that is, you know, it's just a nice, uh, comfortable place to work work around it or check and see how it's doing or whatever. Yeah, it's not. It's not screaming in your ears anymore. That I really appreciate that. Well, do you compare the noise to like a regular centrifugal fan? Or? Could you hear that question? Would you? How would you compare that fan to other centrifugal fans you've been around as far as sound? I haven't really been around a lot of uh, other centrifugal dryers. I guess I haven't been around any. Um, as far as I have some centrifugal fans on uh, irrigation systems on grain bins. And it would be similar, maybe quieter. It, it, it's got a nice roll home to it. Could you talk on your cell phone next to the dryer? I think so, yes. Okay. That, that's the test. That means you can call someone for help when you can't pick yourself up. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think you could because it just it doesn't uh, it doesn't make enough noise to really bother you at all. Tim, question? How is the machine cleanliness? Do the outside screens and inside screens stay clean? Did the machine stay clean? Inside screens, outside screens? Yeah, yeah, I would say, right. There's, uh, you know, probably a little bit of sticky, uh, you get these viewings or whatever right on the top slope. But uh, otherwise, the sides are real clean. And uh, yeah, it, it, it looked good. I wasn't concerned about uh, build up of anything or any fire hazards whatsoever. It looked good. Other questions? Anything you wanted to hear? What was the outside good. temperature of when he was drying? No. What was the outside temperature, the ambient temperature when you were drying, do you recall? Uh, typically uh, uh, around uh, between about 50 and 65 degrees. Any other questions? All right, I think we've answered them. Warren, thank you very much. Your check's wow, in the mail. Uh, <laughs> actually, we're not paying you, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was easy. I'm glad I could help. If there's any more questions, feel free to call. And I guess that uh, kind of sums up my experience with this. Thank, thank you very much. It's been a huge help for the folks in this room to hear it from you. You have a good day. Sure. Glad I could help. Thanks, You're Mark. welcome. Thank you. Bye. Moving along. We, we always feel it, it adds a bit of credibility when you can hear from the uh, farmer direct. So I, I think that was a perfect example 
of a satisfied customer with a, with a brand new product that uh, proved to us manuals do work if you read them. So he, uh, he, did a, he did really good. He was a great guy to work with. We had a couple other sites we'll just touch on really quick just so you can see a couple more installations. This was the one that I was telling you about. This is down at Iowa State at their Ag Engineering Program. It was a little E400, didn't get a lot of run time, but uh, still gave us some good feedback on the machine, the build quality, a couple things that Mike's going to touch on here in a moment about the fan and the bearings and just some little fine tuning that we're going to do to the design before we start building them in larger quantities this next year. Our fifth and final prototype was the E600H, that's the all heat model that we built for our local customer of ours, closer to home in Crystal Lake. We had the 460 volt, 0.094 aluminum screens, had the discharge moisture sampler, and this is just a picture I took out my office window one day when it was driving by. Worked very well, so much that we drove it right up to his site. It's about, I don't know, 10, 15 miles away from us. Um, not really meant for six, 700 mile trips, but definitely moving it around shorter distances, the portability kit worked quite well. And, and the dryer itself too performed very well. The biggest issue we had with that installation, running all heat, just the takeaway equipment. This dryer was way too big for his operation. Probably could have gotten by with a E400H or an E500H. Part of the arrangement with this particular farmer was that we would convert it to a heat plus cool machine. That's what Jeremy was talking about earlier. We really wanted to get an all heat machine and we really wanted to be able to launch this product fully, but we have a commitment to you as dealers and our end users that we will not release a product that we have not extensively tested to our level of uh, what we want to see. And, and so having an all heat machine in operation was vital to that. And, that is what we're doing. It's not a recommended upgrade to go from an all heat to a heat and cool, so don't get any ideas like that. It's just something we had to do to make this particular test site work out. So I talked about a lot of the different testing that we did do once we got these five prototypes installed. And these next couple slides just show a little bit, like what you're looking at here is a plan view of the dryer and where those color contours are on the inside of the plenum. So we install a number of different temperature probes in there and are able to see where we have hot spots, where we have cold spots, and this was just one particular set of data that we took. We actually had some pretty strong winds blowing across the dryer that day. That's why you see some of the heat shifted more to one side. And it allowed us to fine tune some of the baffles and some of the deflectors and things like that that we have inside the plenum to fully optimize it. And we did the same thing on the outside of the dryer as well. This is a side view of the machine and the data is just overlaid over the screens itself. And you can see where you have higher CFM per bushel and lower CFM per bushel. We did a couple adjustments. We went through about six or seven different iterations on a, one particular aspect on the inside of that dryer to get rid of that little bit of dead zone that we have, but for the most part, 95% of the machine was seeing the exact same airflow, which is exactly what we want. So we don't have moisture variations on one side of the dryer versus the other, or in the front of the dryer versus the back. So I think we've done a pretty good job painting the picture of how this product came about, how we designed it, how we built it. We heard from some of our end users. There was a couple things that we probably could have done better on day one, and Mike's going to talk about those things. Those things are being addressed as we speak, and before we build serial number one of full-scale production of Eco Series next year, we're going to incorporate a couple things to make this machine even better than it already is. And so Mike's going to talk about that and fill you in on those details. Thanks. So one of the nice things about having these prototypes out there is that we're able to learn, do some R&D, and see here <coughs> that we can improve. So while it's our goal to bat a thousand right out of the right out of the gate, we know what's more important that when you don't and you see some areas for improvement, that we act and we act quickly. So that's what I'm going to go over right now. A few of these features, and one of them right off the bat here is this base slope screen, and these vertical mounts, these supports. They attach this horizontal one here, and that horizontal is a C channel. And with that C channel up against the base slope the way it is, it creates a void for all fines uh, to build up inside of it. So when we noticed that, we ended up lasering holes inside there. So at the end of the season, they can put compressed air to clean that out. And so what we're eventually going to go to here is a completely different 
base slope screen where we get rid of the perforations for a few inches and have a solid screen. And the solid screen matches up directly to this horizontal support piece so that it blocks off any fines from getting inside that void. It kind of showed just how responsive we are as a manufacturer. You heard Michael mention about straps, so right off the bat, we're going to make that change. So, <laughs> I don't know if you get more responsive than that, but uh, <laughs> one of the areas where we saw was the all heat. And the difference between the all heat and the heat and cool is you kind of notice some more added uh, rigidity to the heat and cool with the floor being in there. But with the heat, all heat dryer, it doesn't have that floor tying the whole screen section together. So. Where we had straps before, we're getting rid of the straps and we're putting solid dividers and we're putting those in at every screen section. The heat and cools don't need it as much, they got that floor holding it in, but we are still going to make a change to that as well. We're going to keep the straps um, every other screen and on the alternating screens we're going to add the same solid divider in there. Along the same lines as the vertical supports that I showed you on that first screen, instead of having them at every other screen, we're going to add those to every screen section, so they would be spanned out every two foot as opposed to every uh, four foot. One of the things that we noticed, uh, we noticed this out in uh, Iowa, was with this takeaway auger was running, there was some vibration going on. This red bracket here bolts to this cross member. The red bracket was originally just formed, so we ended up taking this bracket and making this a welded a weldment. And then also, you'll see this is the, the original. And what we added here is a plate to tie in this, this cutout. The cutout needs to be there so you can actually put the gearbox on and take it off. But with the cutout not being tied, uh, that cross member not being tied together, you lose some rigidity. So we got that rigidity back by adding that plate to tie that cutout together. One of the other things that we did was a motor mount plate. You'll notice these slots on there. We actually made those wider so in case you needed some more belt tensioning, uh, you can do that with ease um, or any kind of maintenance on uh, the, the belts. You can easily move the motor, get the belts off, put new ones on or what have you. We also increased the thickness of the motor mounting plate from a quarter inch to three eighths. <coughs> and we also added another bend in there to give it a little bit more rigidity along this line. Well, we're going to rely still on our uh, fan supplier to give us the shaft and the, and the wheel, but we feel we can do a better job of making the housing all together. And you'll notice on the left is what the, our fan supplier would supply us with, and you'll notice right off the bat that it's the frame that's quite a bit different. The bearing mount here is a vertical mount. You've got two bolts holding this bearing to a vertical piece of steel. The reason why we don't like that so much is as that goes down the road, Quite a few hundred miles it's on and not only that but in operation it's under a load and that bearing would have a tendency to slip it's not doweled or welded in place or anything else like that so what we ended up doing was changing this mount altogether to what you see on the right and we mount that on a horizontal piece of steel so that under any kind of load it can't slip down without going into basically the steel one of the other things we're changing the material as opposed to a 22 gauge uh, galvanized steel, we're beefing that up to 16 gauge mild steel and painting it on Matthews Red. Uh, where they used a uh, 11 gauge uh, steel on the frame, we're beefing that up as well to a 7 gauge mild steel. We're painting this all our, our Matthews Red and we're also chamfering this on the side just to make it a little bit more visually appeasing. So that's some of the things that, uh, some of the changes that we noticed this year. Again, like I said, we want to bat a thousand coming out of the gate, but What's more important to us is see the areas where we can improve and make sure that we're uh, taking action as soon as we could. So that basically concludes our presentation.